First, I'd say uh, thank you, Nicola, for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> I would like to start with a complaint. Um, I was working out in the general area there and I noticed that the television uh, was on and it was playing the cricket from Australia in England. And for those that follow cricket, that was a very stressing observation. Oh, okay. Australia's four for 79 after scoring 138. We're just really glad you don't come from New Zealand. <laughs> So uh, I, I'm still getting over the shock of uh, seeing how Australia's performing, but uh, um, I, I will take solace from the fact that um, our rugby team had some success a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably a bit unfair. Um, uh, firstly, uh, I do have to say it's great to be back here at Gibbs. I've done this, I've been here, in this from, I think at least three times actually, I was reflecting back, so... Uh, um, I've always enjoyed the debates here. Uh, at one time I was actually uh, sharing the podium with uh, one of my friends from the DMR. And that was a little more stressful as an evening, but it was, was still good fun and so I've got great memories. Um, for me as well, coming back to Johannesburg is always a treat. We lived here uh, for six years and uh, I have wonderful memories of, of Johannesburg and our experiences in South Africa. Uh, with children that uh, speak fondly and in fact uh, going on holidays in a couple of weeks we've got two of our South African friends of the children actually coming to spend two weeks with us uh, up in Europe so uh, uh, many many friends and, and wonderful memories. Um, <clears throat> in thinking about the discussion I thought maybe by way of setting up a little bit of context I'd share with you a, a conversation I had with a group of uh, leaders from China. Uh, we actually sponsor um, some work with uh, the Chinese leadership uh, at Cambridge University. And as part of that, myself and others from Anglo-American, including our chairman, Sir John Parker, actually talked to the leaders. And uh, the, the program actually links directly back to the president of China. And we were having a long discussion regarding China, its, its um, position in the world today, the, the challenges they're facing. And maybe if I talk to you through some of the issues, um, there might be some things to recognise. There are some really interesting conversations about the leaders of state-owned enterprises and the leaders of private enterprise and some of the issues they're confronting as a society and, and they will be a couple of points that I pick up and there are some interesting parallels in some of the challenges that um, we're seeing and if you think that in terms of South Africa talking to a state development model and China is going more and more towards private enterprise uh, and, and moving away from its state development model because of the challenges they're facing and a recognition that to compete on a global basis they're going to have to rely on private enterprise and a, and a different type of model. It's an interesting conversation and one that we need to probably reflect on in some of the debate in the debates we have. In an economy such as China, the scale and breadth of its internal market provided a great base to work with which is something we don't have the luxury of sharing in South Africa. That is, we don't have the same sky, scale and scope in terms of our internal market. In China, relatively low salaries, improving productivity levels and the propensity of the Chinese people to put money away in the form of savings have together helped create a virtuous cycle of investment in infrastructure and in their industries and relative Im wage improvements from that lower base have been driven by productivity improvements and that's also supported continuing investment. And so they've tried to set up a virtuous cycle but underpinning development and progression has been continuing improvement in productivity. However, with industrial capacity now in exceeding internal consumption, China's industries have to improve quality and reduce costs in order to compete with the best in the world to win market share for their products because they can't only rely on the internal markets to take the products that they produce. For them, competitive growth will only come as discretionary expenditure supports increasing consumption of new products and services. 
While I'm going to only reflect on a limited part of a much broader conversation, I wanted to raise a point we did cover in that sweeping landscape. The issue of South Africa and its state-owned enterprises was a point of comparison. I'll talk about SOEs. SOEs play a crucial role in our economy and in South Africa, as they do in China. And to a large extent, the ability of South African industries to compete globally is influenced by the effectiveness of our SOEs. Many South African industries rely on and intersect with the services provided by SOEs at critical points in our processes, whether relating to the provision of energy, rail or port services, for example. Unless all the links in the chain develop at the same rate and in collaboration with one another, a pinch point will appear and the change will break or at least be severely constrained. And that then impacts all of us in terms of what we produce and the effectiveness of us being competitive either as the private sector or in terms of other SOEs that also rely on that interconnectedness in terms of those industries. We can see various pinch points with SOEs here in South Africa and no one in this room needs reminding of our current challenges. However, they are an example of the need for private enterprise and government to work together towards achieving broad-based economic prosperity. So in simple terms, for South Africa to be successful, we have to be equally efficient and successful and continue to transform the effectiveness and productivity of our state-owned enterprises along with the private sector. And at the end of the day, if we're playing by different sets of rules or not talking or integrating our approaches, then we impact each other and ultimately it's South Africa that is the poorer for that disconnect. So... So SOEs form an integral part of the backbone of our economic and industrial infrastructure. They must be prioritised for investment and they need to be led through the lens of commercial decision making. So as we have adopted a state development model, as China has, that assumes almost independent development of both state and privately owned enterprises, we need to create the conditions that will help them both be successful and will connect them and help them integrate so that we're successful together. For me, I'm not a politician. It is not up to me to make judgments about whether the state development model is the right model for the country. South Africa has free and fair elections, the politicians make the decisions, and all of us then work within the system. I can voice an opinion or a view, and it doesn't make my opinion or view any relevant than the person next to me. Our job, once that direction is set, is to understand how we, be, we can be constructive in our part of the world to connect to the other parts of the country, whether they be SOEs or other private enterprises or any other structure that is in place. And the point I'm making is that then government does have a responsibility to make sure that we are connecting, that the pieces do work, and that we are successful as a country in that construct. This is something China is trying to come to grips with, and it's been a really important conversation in China. Now, given more than 90% of our SOEs are losing money, we must start to reflect on why that could be so. And further, given the tough conditions our SOEs are experienced, why would we be surprised to hear our private companies complaining that business in South Africa, it's tough. It's tough for all of us. But in private enterprise, we can't lose money because it's your money. I represent our shareholders. And in many cases for us, our shareholders are you. If you've got a pension fund or if you invest... In a, pension co in a company that invests in companies, there's a good chance if those investments are in South Africa, you own and you are an owner of Anglo-American and I work for you. And you charge me with a responsibility to look after your money. And that's a responsibility we take very seriously. And at the end of the day, we have to make tough decisions to ensure that we protect your money, the money of average South Africans. At the same time, we must recognise one cannot fund the other. In China, they are also confronting this dilemma. 
However, they have a very different model. That is, each must survive and make tough decisions required to survive in this competitive world. They're very tough on their SOEs and they're very tough on private enterprise. And we compete basically using the same rules that we have to survive. So I think it's important if we're going to be successful as a country, and we have been. So don't let me leave you thinking that I don't believe we've been successful. I think the last 20 years or 21 years have been an absolute miracle. And I am the first to stand up and say and acknowledge the great work that South Africa has done. But for us to go forward, we have to continue to evolve the debate and change the debate into one where we connect and the role of government integrates the way we work together to be successful together. We have to survive the tough times together. For South Africa to be successful, it cannot be left to one group to carry the burden and lead with competitive and efficient business practices. We must work together as partners to create a sustainable future together. As real partners, we must speak the truth and be constructive in speaking to that truth. No point criticising without coming up with something that could make a difference in bringing those pieces together. So I hope my comments tonight are taken in the spirit of wanting, is in wanting to be a true partner in terms of our position in South Africa and hopefully to inspire some thought and debate in how we might come together and be more effective in terms of making South Africa more successful. Now, in, in, in sorry, I should make one other point. In the conversation, I asked the Chinese about business leadership. And I know we have these really interesting debates about private enterprise and uh, CEOs and we talk about a whole range of things and we talk about salaries and we talk about salaries in public enterprise. And I actually said, in China, it strikes me that the most capable individuals tend to be pulled into the political system because that's the nature of the system and how things work. And I asked, and the people that I were talking to were from private enterprise. And so I said, how would you feel if I were to contend that the most capable people in Chinese society tend to head to the, uh, the party and are part of that construct because at the end of the day, the rewards tend to be for those most senior in the system. And then, in fact, most appointments are via the political system if you're not inside private enterprise. And I said, can you imagine competing with the best of American business where business would argue the best go there? Now, I would also acknowledge, given I'm in a wonderful institution, that in South Africa, the best go to the educational institutions. <laughs> but in actual fact, in terms of capability, each of the institutions attract people for various reasons. In the US, the rewards available to those in private enterprise tend to attract a proportion of very capable leaders. So I said to the Chinese group, so where do you think the best leaders might go in the system? They said, well, political. Now I said, that's always a bit unfair because not everybody is motivated by money. And we had a long debate about how the system attracts the capability and how does society work out where its capability is, is, if you like, distributed to ensure that we've got the right leadership so society is successful versus businesses being successful? And I then reflected on Deng Xiaoping, 1976. To get rich is good. And Jack Welsh at GE that created an organisation the world had never seen. And I then drew some parallels in terms of their behaviours and what they did in leading their respective organisations in being successful. So it was a bit of a, a bit was a difficult conversation. It was a, not an absolute record. Jack Welsh came a little bit later, I think uh, 80s. But we were talking about that leadership and the characteristics, whether you're in business, whether you're in private enterprise, whether you're in academia, or whether you're in social uh, industries, and what are the characteristics of leadership. Maybe a point for discussion a little bit later. First, I'd like to discuss, or I'd like to talk about the convers or my conversation in three parts. First, I would like to start by focusing on what I see as South Africa's natural advantages. Sometimes we forget 
that we do have some significant advantages over other countries and that for us to be successful in a global competitive environment, we must use every tool we have available to us. Naturally, however, I'll also say something on the key constraints we experience in operating in the mining sector in South Africa as part of that conversation. Second, in the mining industry, second, the mining industry is one of the foundations upon which South Africa can build its future. You wouldn't be surprised for me to promote that view. Um, but it can be, and in our view, it can be an engine in its own right, and it can help us develop skills and expertise that can be applied across a much broader range of businesses. In fact, Nicola asked me a question about our operating model at uh, Anglo-American, and, and I said that in actual fact, We've stolen many ideas from Toyota, Ford, BMW, the petrochemical sector in our developing our operating model, which is more a fa manufacturing approach in the mining industry and, and our short experience, and Norman's uh, one of the first guys that's implemented in our operation, he's seen about a 30% improvement, why we believe learning from other industries is actually more important for our future because we generally have pretty close shop, a small group, we learn from each other, we steal each other's good ideas. What we don't tend to do is steal from other industries or other thought leaders and we think that's the place where we will get the best ideas and that's another conversation as well. Third, the adoption of the National Development Plan must be something that brings policy, business and people together. It must work for business, it must work for the government, and support its social commitments, and it must work for the people of South Africa. South Africa cannot build a sustainable future without touching these three or four key points. We all have a part to play, and as I said before, the future of South Africa is too important to be left to politicians alone to do the heavy lifting. We all have a role to play in encouraging dialogue across South Africa's many constituencies, and we must understand how we, work together, we can work together to make a difference. So in terms of natural advantages, and I'll go through a quick list of stuff we see, and I'd always start with the mining industry. Lots of doom and gloom around at the moment. Uh, let's remind ourselves what we have in this wonderful country uh, in terms of endowment and the mad-made infrastructure that we've put in place. We have some of the world's greatest mining assets and minerals resources, according to estimates, worth two, between $2.5 and $3 trillion dollars although maybe not at today's prices. I'll be somewhat lower than that, but it's still significant. We have a highly developed physical infrastructure of roads, airports and railways, including dedicated rail links and ports for the export of minerals and mobile communications. And we often underestimate or undersell the quality of the infrastructure that we do have in place. I think we share a frustration that we're not operating it as well as we could, and that we could do a lot more and need to invest in the future. But consistent, or if I, like, if I could say, compared to many other jurisdictions, we're still pretty well positioned in the game and we could do a lot better. Our position in Africa is the continent's most diversified and sophisticated economy, the Nigerians might argue, with first world financial services, including a stock exchange that is 19th globally in terms of market cap. Now, I would say for those that have visited Nigeria and South Africa, would still rank South Africa well ahead in terms of our infrastructure and the skills that we have available to us and how we are generally managing our affairs in the country. We've got world-class universities and business schools. Our international reputation in the field of medicine is almost second to none. We are a first-class tourist destination, if you can get a visa. <laughs> so I should apologise to Malusi for that one. That was a low blow. Our people who are eager to learn and upgrade their skills and who are increasingly entrepreneurial-minded, very significant. By the way, the visa issue is a very big one. We, as a company rely on Chinese, believe it or not, to actually sell diamonds or to buy diamonds. They have only two locations where they can personally front up and have their visa photos. So at the end of the day, most of them unable to get in the country to actually perform the work required to buy diamonds. So for us, it's a major issue. And we have to think about the consequences of our policy settings in those countries for doing business. And at the moment, we've made it almost impossible for the Chinese to come here and do business, which we absolutely rely on. So we do ask, when policies are set, 
that the unintended or the potential unintended consequences are considered. We are a shining beacon for African democracy with our parliamentary system of government, our constitution, independent judiciary, free press, and our vibrant public and private institution. Now, when I talk about free press, Alan, everything I say should be taken in context. And if I say something <laughs> controversial, I hope you do balance it with something very positive. And I said that I think Gwedi is a wonderful guy. <laughs> I'll leave the other side of the comment for a little bit later. <laughs> and some of the constraints on mining and industry's competitiveness, we are becoming increasingly competitive, which is a function of the mature mining industry. All grades continue to decline as a function of the maturity of our operation, which places a huge question mark over how much our vast mineral endowment is economically extractable. Obviously, we can't develop these resources at a cost greater than the realisable price. Many of our underground operations are becoming unviable as we have to mine at greater depths. We're mining at 4,000 metres. No one in the world is mining anywhere near those depths. I think the closest would be around 2,000 metres, maybe in Brazil at the old Sir John mine. Uh, the, the technical achievements of our industry are remarkable and second to none, in spite of what the Australians think. Here as elsewhere, the mining industry has a legacy of inefficient capital allocation with cost overruns that have been typically of the order of 20 to 30 per cent on major projects, and in our case, more at times. Labor, energy and other input costs continue to outstrip inflation, so productivity is steadily going down. Now, that's not so much an issue where volume is the issue and you've got a rising price that's beating inflation, but today, that's turned and we've got decreasing prices and we've still got increasing costs. And the two points or the two curves are now starting to intersect. And we've already seen in the last week companies that have declared a crisis in their own circumstance and companies like ours that have said we're going to have to take some tough actions to be competitive to make sure we don't get into that same situation. These are critical times. Because of the ongoing squeeze on costs and returns, the South African mining industry's operating models and technologies are now lagging those in other mining institutions or in um, uh, mining jurisdictions. And so for us, and our uh, utilisation of equipment is in some cases 30 or 40 per cent behind our most aggressive competitors. And we have to turn that round as a company in the next two years, or we won't be operating and that's the challenge and certainly we believe we can drive to the talents but we as a country have to rise to that exact same challenge. We have been constrained by, excess, by expensive yet inadequate and unstable electricity supply and by capacity limitations on state-run rail links from mine sites to export terminals. Now I will say that I think the Transmonet team has done a very good job. We have a very good relationship and I'd like to acknowledge the great work they've done. But at the same time the system needs more investment we have to work together to make sure we can grow and it can grow with us together, but it also has to be economically competitive. Investors in South African mining have been scared off by uncertain mining industry regulation and, friendly and, and, and in some cases unfriendly investment policies. This has been reflected in the country largely missing out on the recent mining boom, in growing difficulties in gr attracting capital, and the credit rating agencies marking down mining companies here and, to go with that, the, trails of the, the travails of the RAND. Put simply, the, capital, the cost of capital is high and rising, not falling, as you may think. And by that I mean, as our credit ratings drop, even though we may, we've had relatively low interest rates, the cost to borrow funds for companies like ours are going up because our credit ratings are being impacted by people's perception of the jurisdictions in which we work. So the drop in ratings of South Africa is a serious issue for companies that work in South Africa or who are based in South Africa, and that's a critical issue. Our long history of adversarial labour relations, and particularly the trust deficit between labour, business and government, which has been accentuated in the Marikana tragedy, remains a great challenge for us to rise to. This is severely hindering the creation of a more efficient mining industry and of a more competitive South Africa. And let me say that in mentioning that challenge, 
we as management have to take responsibility for those things that don't work in that construct. Labor leaders have to take some responsibility for their role in that issue, as does government. But as management, we will start with ourselves. We have to look in the mirror, and there are many things that we have to correct and to, to make sure that we're part of the solution. I think, from our point of view, and on the subject of the Marikana tragedy, it is good to see the Farlam Commission report is in. We take to heart the recommendations of the Farlam report. We also call on all players in the industry to reflect and learn from the Marikana tragedy. We've made significant progress as Anglo-American in the areas of development of mining communities and remuneration and housing and the living conditions of our people. Many people will know the work we're doing at the moment in terms of debt uh, of our employees and how we can support them change their world and also help people understand finances and other things that we should be doing as part of our basic training in our organisation. We also acknowledge there's a lot, of, lot more work to be done and again we have to do that together. For several years South Africa's mining industry has been underperforming its global peers. Today South Africa falls, out the top, falls outside the top 50 mining jurisdictions and, and is languishing at number 56 in the World Economics Forum uh, global Competitive Index, having slipped another three places in 2014. We have to pull that around. To have the most significant resource endowment in the world and to be ranked number 56 in terms of the Competitive Index is, for all of us, it's unacceptable. We can't live with that position. We should be top 10. And in fact, for us to realise our potential, that's where we have to be. The consequence of being at number 56 is as close as, as significant as this. If mining had come to the party with a growth rate matching the rest of the economy over the past 20 years, we would have seen annual average growth rate over that period rising from 3.2% for the country to 4%. A significant 25% improvement on what we've achieved over that period. And there would have been 20% more jobs, equivalent to 260,000 direct and indirect positions created in our industry. We'd be in a very different conversation. We have to take the long view and work out how that statistic is not repeated in the next 20 years. Despite the challenges on many fronts, they are insurmountable, and South Africa's future is still inextricably linked to what happens in our industry. Mining remains, arguably, the country's most important industry, contributing about 18% of South Africa's GDP, that's in direct and direct terms, 60% of exports, more than 500,000 direct jobs and more than 800,000 indirect jobs. Through taxes and other benefit, Mining pays 20 cents in every rand that is invested in public infrastructure and social benefits. Moreover, we are still investing heavily in the future of our assets and our country. My own group alone has, has a multi-billion rand investment program in turning around our mines and in new projects across all of our businesses in South Africa, iron ore, coal, platinum and diamonds. Traditionally, the mining industry has also been a great source of competitive advantage for South Africa. But if we cannot at least arrest its decline in productivity and reduce our costs, we won't have a viable industry to build the country. And the significant decline in shareholder value that investors have experienced in our last 10 years has been significant. While the JSE has outperformed the New York Stock Exchange, and my data may be 12 months old, the mining industry has actually been flat. In fact, it's declined further, so that on a relative basis and relative to our peers, we've destroyed something like 40 to 50% of the underlying value in our industry. That is why we're ranked number 56. That is why we have consistently underachieved on our potential. Well, that's the outcome in terms of that underachievement. And as a country, we cannot afford to continue that track record and aspire to be the country we aspire to be. So how do we build a roadmap for South Africa's future? In order to create a competitive South Africa, government, business and labour must work together. There is no other way. 
The government has a right or role to play in leading, facilitating and encouraging dialogue around accelerating the implementation of the National Development Plan. We must build bridges and find common ground. As hard as that may be, and to do, and to do so in the current and do so on the basis of mutual respect and trust is a challenge, but personally I've been involved in a number of forums where I've seen that achieved and it's built significant progress in a whole range of fronts, not the least safety for our industry. South African mining industry has been the most significantly improving industry across the world, bar none, in safety in the last 10 years. The achievements have been remarkable. Every CEO and business leader has come together and worked with the government and with Labor to create a different outcome. And I think we should be proud of what's being achieved, but at the same time not satisfied with where we are. We believe it's time for a national conversation to map out a way forward for South Africa where we give people, with, we give people a greater opportunity for a better life by becoming a more mature, modern, competitive, just and prosperous democracy. As a mining leader, I think our sector should be putting its full weight behind the structural reforms identified in the NDP and specifically President Zuma's nine-point plan. I believe the latter shows considerable foresight in looking at the long-term needs of the country, particularly in regard to energy, broadband and enhancing the value chain in mining and agriculture. Government must play its part in creating an attractive climate for investment. Mining, however, can only again become a core driver of South Africa's economy, helping to deliver on the great expectations placed on it in the NDP to the extent that the conditions are put in place to support an attractive climate for investors. As we look at resource investment landscape and the challenges the mining industry is facing, I would like to, for all of us to keep in mind that one of Anglo-American's board members, Jim Rutherford, who was also one of the lead uh, investment managers for the Capital Group, which is a low global organisation, made a really important point at the uh, Joburg um, in Daba last year. And the point was a really simple one. Investment follows returns. It's not the other way around. Investment follows returns. If anybody thinks that investment or returns is a dirty word, then please don't expect investment to come to South Africa. Investment follows returns. And that's what we're being judged on now. And in our mining industry, we're not delivering returns. And until that changes, we can't hope for people to invest in South Africa. We have to help ourselves turn that position around. Where investors don't see a worthwhile return, they won't invest. In such an investment climate, not only will it be difficult to attract the long-term FDI flows needed for new mines, but also the necessary financing stay in business. We spend a lot of capital on stay in business capital. Today, as Anglo-American, 60 to 70% of the capital we spend is sustaining the current production levels from our mines. We could tomorrow make a decision to cut capital. If we cut our stay in business capital and starve our businesses, we won't close tomorrow. We probably won't close in five years' time. But in ten years' time, when we're closing the mines, the conversation becomes an ugly one. The problem is you can't reverse it. Now, we're committed and we're putting the capital in place to sustain our minds. But if it gets to a point where we don't see a future, the first thing that we hit as an industry is that stay in business capital. And the problem is you don't see it until we're closing mines. Now, resources do deplete because we are mining a depleting resource. That's the challenge of mining. But when we start pulling stay in business capital back, that's the disaster. That's the crisis coming. And in some cases in our industry today, people are cutting staying business capital. That's what's happening. That's what's happening. We are losing our future. And unless we turn those conversations around and do everything we can to encourage people to invest in that staying business capital, we won't have a future. And you won't even know it happened until it's too late. That's the challenge we all have to make sure that we rise to. Where investors don't see those returns, they don't invest. 
And for us, in the long term, that means lower national tax receipts, fewer jobs and less sustainable communities. To think otherwise is to show a profound misunderstanding of how modern global capital markets operate. Now, we can have the ideological debates, and at the end, the capital markets are not efficient on a year-by-year -year basis, but in the long term, they are. And the unfortunate thing, or the f unfortunate challenge we have to confront is that over time we are being, if you like, outbid for that discretionary capital. And today's, in today's world where it's even more difficult, we're not getting the slice we should be. So in boosting South Africa's returns to investors, or attractiveness to investors, we should not look to government to provide all the answers. As business, we have to stand up. Government does have a key role to play in facilitating and encouraging dialogue and encouraging and fostering enabling environment uh, to support or be supportive of the South African mining sector so that we can be successful and make our contribution. So in short, I would make the following appeal to government. And I want to say again from the outset, Alan, government has done many good things and has been very constructive in many of the conversations that I've been involved. So I don't want this to be read as a list of complaints per se. They are specific requests in areas that I think we have to do better and we are appealing to the governments to work with us in a constructive dialogue to improve our positioning. First, we need to demonstrate a strategic orientation in appreciating that mining is a long-term business and one of South Africa's few industries that is able to give the country a competitive advantage on a global scale and in the long term. That is, when we make a decision, we make a decision for 30 to 50 years. Governments that change every five years cannot change policy settings every five years. If that is how we're going to run the country Please don't be surprised that mining will struggle to support the direction of the country if it changes every five years. When we set policy frameworks for the country, it has to be for 30 years. We have to take on the ideological conversations that are necessary for investors to feel that they can rely on what we're doing over 30 years. The Constitution is a great example of a document that will give us comfort for the long term, but that then has to be backed up with a consistency of approach through every five years in terms of the policy setting mechanisms for the major parties. And this goes across the political spectrum. Second, we need to provide greater clarity on ownership. You've read many books about various political structures, capital. The most important things in terms of capital and making progress is certainty around ownership and tenure of land. We need to sort out the current impasse on BEE -E, uh, B -E -E, B -E, B -E and BEE -E -E, ownership so that people are willing to invest. We can't keep changing the rules and quite frankly, the courts are not the place to sort that issue out on a long-term sustainable basis. The courts should be there to test an interpretation in a particular circumstance. But the courts shouldn't be there to provide an answer on a far more global and holistic issue. We think that has to be a dialogue and it has to start now. And we have to make sure that we come to a solution that isn't reliant on a single judge or a legal system that is not constructed, quite frankly, to provide the answers and guidance in terms of where this society goes. And so we want to engage in a very different conversation and sort that issue out. And for those where we and the government may differ on whether empowerment has been delivered or served, then let that particular issue, because every issue with an individual company will be different, that can be tested in the courts. But don't let the courts decide the future of this country. That's not their role. Their role is to interpret the constitution and the legal framework for the country and make sure that those laws, statutes, 
the principles that have founded this constitution are appropriately interpreted to make sure that that track is navigated in an appropriate way. We need to facilitate consistent policies and legislation across government departments. Investors need coherence and stability. We must integrate policy between governments before, we become, before the policy is enacted because an inconsistent policy in one department can be an absolute or create an absolute crisis in another department. We have to get beyond that and the integration of policy is critical in terms of making sure we're sending consistent and the correct messages across all facets or all areas of society. We must not let the expression of ideological differences manifest in different departments' approach to framing policy. We must not, must not let ideological differences in various government departments frame policies that don't link to the broader thrust of the government's platform. We need to ensure that all mining companies complete, compete on a level playing field and that, from all of our points of view, we are playing in a competitive environment. I think generally that's pretty well practised across the industry, but it is a point that I think we should always make. We must create and maintain supporting energy, water, transport and other infrastructure required for business to function. If the government is unable to fund that infrastructure, and by the way, most governments can't, then let and encourage private enterprise do the job within a construct of a national infrastructure strategy. Let us help. Let us become part of the answer. Don't take that accountability and responsibility on as an individual government. Let's make sure that there's a partnership and I think many of the policy setting conversations are heading in the right direction on that front and again I think that's been picked up well in the NDP. Please carefully consider the implications of declaring a mineral as being strategic in terms of investment appetite. In fact there's nothing wrong with declaring a mineral strategic but let's make sure the implications of that declaration protect the rights and ownership of those that have invested monies per the constitution so that there's no investor that's scared to invest because they think a government may change the rules. We have a constitution. Let's make sure all of our policy setting frameworks are consistent with the, with the constitution. And please, let's not change bilateral trade agreements that protect foreign investment Let's not arbitrarily cancel those agreements without giving careful thought to the unintended consequence of those types of actions. That's critical. We must apply international commercial logic to the beneficiation of mineral products. We can't create unsustainable industries without building them on a base that we can and we believe can be competitive in the long term. There is certainly nothing wrong with encouraging investment, supporting start-up companies, but we must have a longer-term strategy and belief that an industry can be competitive in its own right. And then there are transition processes and approaches to do that. In all of our policy setting frameworks, let's make sure that our competitiveness as a country is protected and not reduced. At the end of the day, any policy framework that we develop should be tested against its ability to improve the competitiveness of the country. If it reduces the competitiveness of the country, it should be kicked out. We have 26% unemployment. It should be the most important criteria used in deciding whether legislation will less promote investment, will less promote jobs. Does it stand that test? If not, it shouldn't be passed. Now, I qualify that in terms of social equity and making sure from a social perspective we remain a socially fair and equitable society. And that is a great challenge given, us our, given our history. But I make it within that context. Fortunately, 
And I'm always encouraged that I believe there are people in government that understand those principles and speak for those principles and argue for those principles. And in the main, I think we are making progress. But we aren't making progress fast enough and we need to do a lot more and we need to be part of that conversation and we need to work out as a business how to engage in that conversation more effectively and in certainly and in, and in terms of making more, an, more of an impact. I think within government itself, I think there is a broad agreement that government should provide more policy direction, including a less onerous and more flexible regulatory framework for industry, because the current situation is deterring investors, stifling growth and de denying South Africa its true potential. In particular, I'm encouraged there is a greater degree of coordination and sense of urgency regarding the plans of ESCOM. And I salute Brian for being so divisive, divisive I shouldn't say divisive, that's decisive uh, and quick in his act. Poor Brian, don't you report me saying that. <laughs> uh, decisive in his actions. He's got a tough job and every one of us should be there supporting him. Uh, whilst we may not agree on all things, I've got no doubt he's committed to, to, to turning the, the situation around and making the right calls for the country. So let us encourage that type of leadership across all of our SOEs and, un and, and help us work together to understand how we can help turn around the success so that each one of them is making a positive contribution to the fiscus. And as Minister Nenny quite rightly pointed out, we need for them to be making a contribution, not drawing from the well. That's what a competitive South Africa looks like. Every one of those groups making a contribution and helping creating a more just and effective South Africa. The mining industry today has to tackle an increasingly complex set of technical and societal challenges, as you know. And from our point of view at the moment, we are struggling in terms of prices for our commodities, some areas oversupplied, and so we're going to have to make some pretty tough decisions. It is probably the toughest period I've seen in my 39 eight years. There's probably one other period which was just as tough. And as a consequence, we have to take pretty direct and tough actions. In this scenario, I'm not surprised that individual mining companies continue to demonstrate a silo-like insularity at times. For many, running one's own business, as opposed to considering what needs to be done in the greater industry, is tough enough. But now more than ever, we're all in it together, and I think we have to work together as an industry more effectively, and I see Roger Baxter there, uh, as an industry to understand how we can help each other through these tough times, because in the end, we're all here for South Africa. We may be competitors, but there are many forums in which we don't compete that we can help each other be more competitive, because at the end of the day, if we're all more competitive, then South Africa's the winner, and we're all winners in our own right as well. In terms of the government, let me also give, give credit where credit is due. I think the Operation Pakisa represents an important initiative on the part of the government to bring government policy, business and people together, with stakeholders from the private sector, business, academia and other elements of civil society collaborating with the government in order to improve the implementation of the state's programs and policies. It may well turn out to be a significant milestone on South Africa's journey to improve competitiveness and attractiveness to investors. This is why anglo america and myself personally, along with Roger and the team, will be an enthousi enthusiastic participant in the Pakisa Mining Lab, whose purpose is to develop a shared vision and growth strategy for the mining sector with the aim of doubling real fixed investment in the industry by 2030 or to put it in the context of my early points, to help the government understand what we need to be competitive so that we work with the, with the DMR to help deliver or develop a mining strategy that works for South Africa, that works for the industry, and that works for the people of South Africa and including every employee in the industry. In my view, it's the only way we're going to crack this nut and be successful on all fronts. Pakisa as a whole is a very interesting development as it demonstrates government's willingness not only to work together with a range of South African constituencies, and for me it's the most exciting development I've seen in my nine years in being involved in South Africa. It is a concept that was first piloted in Malaysia and 
it was about big, fast results. It's a transformation methodology, for example, where we come together, agree on the sorts of things, five big issues that we need to tackle on a tripartite basis, and we develop plans, and the ministry is then the convening agent for bringing us together to make a difference. And I think it has to be done on a national basis. The MIGDET uh, process in the industry has done some really good things, but unless it connects to other government departments, it is buried in that type of inertia, or, or if you like, held back by inertia, and that isn't connected to other governments. And mining Pakisa becomes part of a range of Pakisas for the government that starts to connect governments and, and force that integration of government policy that I was talking about earlier. Now, in talking about solutions for industry, I did note the comments of the Secretary-General of the ANC earlier this week and his comment that cutting labour is lazy. I'd like to say that, from my point of view, I understand the observation he makes, i.e., and this is how I'm interpreting it, have you looked at every avenue to improve your business before cutting labour? The answer is, in our case, yes. I've been criticised as a mining leader, or as the mining leader for Anglo-American, that we've been too slow to react. For me, I take that criticism as the leader, I would say, in my own defence and in our defence, we have looked at every angle. We've looked at every opportunity. We're introducing a whole range of new initiatives designed to change the efficiency of the engine room in each of our operations. We felt that was the right place to work. Unfortunately, no one told the rest of the world that commodity prices weren't allowed to move or drop quicker than we anticipated. And so today, in an effort to get ahead of that curve, we've had to move into areas of change much quicker than we would otherwise have liked. And I've got to say, probably more aggressively than we would otherwise have done had we been given the opportunity to take very logical and rational steps. Now, to do it more aggressively, we have to take some risks, and it ends up being a lot tougher than we would like to do. But if we don't take those steps, we won't be competitive and we won't achieve our potential, and we will not deliver to you as shareholders, or for those, many of you here, what we need to do to make sure that we protect, enhance our investment and give you the sort of pension, um, the, the, the outcomes for the pension that you're looking for, given that you're a shareholder of our company. So, to the Secretary General, I would say, we have an idea. We've put this idea up many times, and we're going to do it again. And we're going to bring it to the Pakisa. But let me say it in clear and simple terms. If we can work with Labor and the government to negotiate, navigate, talk to a more flexible Labor structure, not asking people to work more hours, address the issues of migrant labour in a more constructive way and address the social issues and pressures that we have that would actually allow us to operate our plant more hours in a year, which provides more employment because we're more productive, then we think we can make a positive difference and preserve some jobs that would otherwise be lost if we stay on the track we're on. We've put this proposition a number of times and for many it's been too tough because it means change. And in a country where we have adverse or adversarial industrial relations, that's a tough conversation. But we have to have that conversation if we're going to change the future for our industry. And today the day has come. We have to make that change or the job losses won't continue, they will accelerate. That's the brutal reality we're facing in this industry today. And the problem is that the victims of that brutal reality are the workers that, for us, are the heart and soul 
of our business. So, I believe the dialogue between ourselves, Labor and the government is absolutely critical. Some years back, we, in another life, sponsored trips overseas looking at different labour structures and approaches in different countries. And we got a very positive and constructive conversation and dialogue running about possibilities for South Africa. The problem, and Roger remembers all of this, the problem was people thought that it would be very difficult to sell to the workforce. Confronted with the options that we have in front of us today, I think there's a good chance it could be a different conversation. That's the conversation we want to champion as a group with our colleagues across the industry. At the end of the day, I think we can address some of those issues like migrant labour and like the structures we've had that, in my view, are not fit for purpose in 2015. They may have been 30 years ago in a different world. They're not today. And if we're going to change, then we better start to change because there is no future if we don't. For us, we talk about partnerships. In the end, if we don't engage in that conversation and create those partnerships where we each listen and work together to find a different outcome or a different solution to that problem, we're not going to be successful in any case. So there's no point us as a company trying to ram it through. It won't work. There's no point the government trying to legislate it through and having two unhappy participants on the other side. That's not going to work. And there's no point Labor standing there saying we're not going to move because the consequence is too terrible to contemplate in terms of no jobs. And we're seeing it today and it's playing out in the most terrible way. I do want to make a point that we have announced a restructuring of business, some sale of assets. Of the 53, 54,000 jobs that people talk about us shedding I do want to remind you that only 15% are actual reductions of labour in terms of the roles they're in. 85% are us selling assets and putting those assets in others' hands because the assets themselves, we don't believe, fit what we should be doing in the next 10 to 15 years. Don't fit, I think, our core skills most, and I think others will do better. It would be wrong for us to run those assets for cash and shut them prematurely against what somebody else might achieve who's willing to put some more capital into those assets and think of a more constructive or, if you like, more collaborative, productive way of operating. But I do want to make sure people understand that, that the, the numbers that were quoted uh, need to be understood uh, fairly carefully. In South Africa, we've partnered many towards the transformation of the, un of the industry in the country through our open forums in technical innovation, creating BE-owned and run mining companies of scale, which are able to compete with established players, players. I think we've made a mistake, though. We've not let BE companies fail as a conscious policy decision. It is the right call to do everything you can to make sure the company fails. But if it's going to fail on the basis that the leadership is not able to compete then the tough reality that has to be faced is maybe it should fail because the money that could have been otherwise directed to a new and emerging BE player may be better spent on that group who will make it work. If we prop up those that can't be successful, we do those that can be and will be and have the capacity and the desire to be successful, we do them a disservice. I don't want that to be heard the wrong way, but it's a reality, it's a tough market, and natural selection in that market, if you've given the opportunity, you've got to make sure that you deliver on all your commitments as a partner, but at the end of the day, if the team isn't able to rise to the challenge, it may have to fail. And unless we understand and are constructive in that process, then I think we are doing many of the people coming through the system and, and I see more and more leadership standing up that really does have the capacity but they don't have economic support for what they're doing because we're tying up resources with those that maybe won't be able to make it. 
That's a tough call and that's something we're thinking very carefully about in our business. If I say this, if we've got a partner, we'll do everything we can to make sure the partner's successful. But at some point, we have to make some tough calls and it doesn't serve anybody well if we're propping up something or someone that won't be successful. We're doing a lot of work on enterprise development. We've created more than 90,000 jobs. We are very proud of our local procurement initiatives and the work we've been doing. Boosting competency of our employees is actually core to our business. Every employee in our group can, can join an employee share plan. Some of these schemes, such as Envision at Coomba, have transformed the lives of many of our lower paid employees. The tripartite health and safety initiative between Anglo-American government has been a great success and certainly something we've learned a lot about in terms of how we can improve our safety. And in light of Mining Charter 3, we also wish to be constructively engaged with government to take forward the current transformation conversations in a, manager, in a manner that re-establishes South Africa's leadership position in the, global mining, in the global mining industry. In the same context of creating partnerships, I also think it is important to share a conversation that I had with a past mining industry leader, and it was both a union rep and an industry leader. And we talked about that conversation I was talking about earlier about changing the whole labour framework. I had a business leader that actually said, I'm not sure I can navigate this one because the pain of implementing something that may not be accepted may be something I won't survive as a leader of the company. On the other side, I had a union leader who said, well, I might not survive it as a union leader because if I introduce something new to my members that, that will look different and might be hard to get through, I may have a lot of members who will then go to another union because the other unions say, well, I'll, I'll leave things as they are, but I'll get you a lot more money. And if I could say this, in my view, both failed the leadership test. If we want to be seen as leaders, we have to put some personal skin in the game and be prepared to lose, and lose personally. Because if we don't, then I think we fail the test of leadership. Tonight, some of my comments may be reported as not being constructive. That's not my intention. I may do some damage to relationships, but that's the risk you take if you take a position and argue that position. I think the real test is you have to be constructive, you have to show people a pathway and we have to take a risk. And every one of us, if we're going to change and build off the great foundations this country has had and can do and can be, then I think each of us has to take a personal risk if we're going to be counted as leaders in the country. In closing, and I'm probably running a bit over time. 30 years ago, Anglo-America took the lead in seeking a way out for South Africa's political impasse when the then chairman, Gavin Rally, led a delegation of South African business leaders to meet the then banned ANC in Lusaka. I mention that not just to wave the Anglo-American's flag, as it were, but to show that our company has a long tradition of being a development partner that is trying to make a real and positive difference beyond the workplace and for society at large, and we take that responsibility very seriously. Leading a company in an industry where a profile such as mining requires more than just doing the internal things well, we have to work collectively to create a policy and social environment for our industry to continue to grow and improve its contribution to society. We are committed to being thought leaders and being solution seekers. This means addressing the trust deficit in many respects, which has been a widening gulf between the mining industry and its many constituencies. Those that would be aware of our uh, faith-based work, our community development work, will get a sense of what we're prepared to do and what opportunities we see in terms of building a different set of relationships for the future. In terms of South Africa, business and labour, we have to work together. Our current deep suspicion of each other is simply not sustainable and is evidence to the world that the miracle of the rainbow nation is floundering as it cannot get past self-interest and eight, doubted, eight outdated ideological mantras. And I'm talking both sides. 
This process of coming together is proving to be particularly difficult. However, as job losses continue to rise in the weak pricing environment for commodities, I submit that we each have to put our differences aside and come together and look for common solutions. To put the position more bluntly, the mining industry is and must modernise technologies, operating models and management and work practices. And I put the two together. We, we can see a way that will help protect jobs, but not without associated change that we must all navigate. And we have to accelerate that change. There will be many job casualties in this current environment. The key is can we create more job opportunities to soften the tough times we are facing and create new foundations for growth that will address and help build a different future. Mining success is a prerequisite for South Africa's success. You can't have one without the other. Our simple reality is must be confronted. However, without mining, without investment in new capacity, we won't be able to support the delivery of a mining recovery. We, not, we won't be in a position to provide you no, new jobs and we will not be able to support the delivery of the National Development Plan's objectives. If our industry has to be successful, our industry has to be successful in South Africa is to reap the full benefit of its mineral endowment. At the heart of the issue is how we get South Africa's mining industry back on the growth track and where it can generate relatively consistent and attractive returns over the long term. We need to turn the vicious cycle that we're in, or the vicious circle that we're in, and we're now experiencing, into a virtuous circle with the industry operating in a facilitating environment, environment that is conducive to making profits and where investment attracts further investment. And that requires a shift in mindset on all sides, from business, government and labour, if our mining industry is to continue to be a crucial partner in development as a significant contributor to the fiscus, a major employer and the cornerstone for ongoing livelihood of host communities. As an industry, we need to be able to promote confidence and conviction and play our part into the solutions that have to develop with the country. Our solutions must be based on a clear and consistent approach to improving the attractiveness of the country and the industry as an investment destination. In that respect, I do feel it's right and fair to point out that the regulatory framework has become increasingly difficult to navigate and that the industry should show its willingness to work with the government to simplify this framework, and that's the offer we make. Government could play an even bigger role in supporting the industry and to attract investment in mining, not least in providing encouragement to a new generation of business leaders and entrepreneurs. Again, as I said before, however, we cannot reward failure. We must encourage and support success. We've got to get that balance right. Above all, the South African industry has to be more productive. That is, we must produce more product per person employed. If we don't get that equation right, we don't have a future. We'll only make significant progress if we can achieve the required technical operation and commercial breakthroughs that other industries have managed, along with a significant expansion of the kind of business government partnering we've seen in areas of safety and fuel cell development, for example, in our platinum business. Finally, I hope I haven't given you the impression that we see business as blameless. We're not. We take full accountability for our leadership and its failings, our management processes and the fact that they are not where they need to be. And as individuals and from a personal level for the things that we should have done that we didn't. We are open and very open to sharing taking advice and being part of a solution that works for all South Africans. Finally, we need to change the nature of the conversation we have in mining so that all of our constituents start to work together in tackling the constraints that are hampering the traditional powerhouse of South Africa's economy from being globally competitive once again. Only through success Will the South African mining industry restore its competitive advantage and be able to attract essential foreign investment? We have to face 
the tough truths and start working on solutions. We've got to stop shouting across the corridors and start working. And I think the pathway that we've chosen as an industry, as a government, and I hope with our Labor colleagues through the process that will begin on October will be the starting point of something very different for the country. We have a new generation of leaders that I see and speak to every day. And in fact, I'm actually speaking with a group of our Anglo-American team uh, that Nicholas actually helped us set up. And so I guess if I could finish by quoting uh, one Nelson Mandela, and given that it is Mandela month, if I leave you with a quote, sometimes it falls upon a generation to be great. You can be that generation. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for your insightful comments, your openness, your provocations, of which I think there have been, there've been many. I'm conscious we run by a very tight clock at Gibbs. We always wrap up these forums by half past seven, um, that we have about uh, 12 minutes for some questions. So I'm going to exercise my prerogative as dean with the first question. We'll open to the floor, and I'm going to ask, I'm going to take two questions from non-press in the room, and then I'm going to open to press because um, I know that press will have many questions here. Um, so, so, Mark, what, what struck me in, in thinking, and you haven't spoken a lot about the, the Anglo-American strategy since you took over, um, one word you used a lot tonight was tough. Uh, and, and it struck me that in your uh, leadership career, you've come into some very tough environments. You came into anglo Goldashanti with a toxic hedge book. You um, came into Anglo-American with a very strong need to have impact quickly. You've spoken about big, fast results and the need for us to achieve big, fast results in our SOEs, in some of our companies. What kind of leadership style supports that? Um, I, you used the word style. Um, I, I first think that leadership has to be capable and equipped to do the work. So the experience the ability to do the work is absolutely critical. And so the selection of a leader on the basis of capability, I think, is the first to lift. If, if the person is not able to handle the complexity of the role, nothing else matters mm. because they can't lead a group and help connect the dots and take them forward in any constructive way if they're not capable in role. And in my experience in industry, it's the single most important issue in selecting a leader and getting it right. On the basis that they're capable and equipped to do the work, I wrote a couple of ways that it's vision, it's courage and resilience, communication and the ability to bring people together, and it's about being authentic, direct, mm. and being able to bring the conversation in a way that are meaningful to the people that are impacted. And I think those are the characteristics that you have to bring to a role. And at the end of the day, all of us will probably fall down on one, maybe all at times. Uh, but if, you ha if you're not bringing those sort of characteristics to the leadership role, then I think it's very, very difficult to motivate and lead a group of people into the unknown. And in many cases, as a leader, that's what you're doing. 